Good morning. Welcome to First Frisco United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Doesn't it feel good to be upright and able to worship together? Amen. Amen. We're so glad that you came in to visit us, whether you're here in the sanctuary or whether you're online with us. Thank you. Thank you. And as we prepare to open up worship, there's a red registration pad on the end of your pew. Make sure you sign in so we can remember that you were here today. Then pass it down and make sure everyone on your row signs in. And there is a link online for you to uh, also register. Before we begin, a few announcements. Discipleship, fall discipleship is here. Our brochures are out on the table and places to sign up. There are classes in the morning, during the day, in the evening, almost every day of the week. Um, there are classes uh, for um, specific Bible studies, specific topics, and there's even one, say, for financial planning. And we have a new ministry for our veterans. I thought I said, so Dave Platowski, Dave, wave your hand. Dave is a veteran, and for all of those veterans, men, women, whichever branch of the service you were in or are serving, uh, new ministry for our veterans. It's a lot's going on, many ways which you can grow. And then today, maybe you've seen the table out there. We know it's fall. The apple butter sale is on, amen? <laughs> there are a, a, a jars of sugar-free and regular support a United Methodist women who then support many of the ministries of our church with the sales. Amen. Next Sunday, next Sunday, September the 12th, a family affair from 430 to 6, bingo and lasagna on next Sunday evening. All ages, lots of fun, great lasagna, a great way for the family to do something together. And so um, you will need to sign up, register, get a ticket so we can make sure that we have enough food for everyone. Sunday, not Sunday, Saturday, September the 11th. That is Sunday. But is it Sunday up there? Sunday, but Sunday. So Saturday, September the 11th, Saturday, September the 11th, there is an adult and children's choir open house. Amen. Are you guys ready for us? Amen. They're looking for an opportunity to see what the choir is all about. Just a come and go affair. <clears throat> There'll be music and singing and dancing and cookies, all kinds of things. Give the opportunity. Our choir, they rehearse on Wednesday evenings. And our children are on Sunday evenings at at 4:30. At 4:30, so come on out and find out everything about the choir. And now, if you will, stand and join us with our opening hymn. Open my eyes that I may see. Hymn 454.
let us continue to worship, lifting up what it is we believe with the Apostles' to greet, the Apostles' Creed. All together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. I would invite our children to come forward. Pastor Mark has a message just for you. Can you all see what's in this picture? Can you see what's in that picture? What do you see? What do you see? You know? What do you see? A deer. Do you see that? You see that? So that's a mommy deer and a baby deer. What do you call a mommy deer? A doe. And what do you call a baby deer? fawn. So this is a picture of a mommy deer and a baby deer. Actually, there was another baby deer. There were two with this mommy. And that's Jojo sitting right there because literally that picture was taken out the back window of a house in Washington State. And so I keep this not because this is so valuable, but because it reminds me of a really incredible experience that we had one time. You got the hiccups, haven't you? All right, what are all the remedies for hiccups? Drinking out the backside of a glass or holding your breath or standing on your head, right? I might just embarrass her and then she won't have them anymore. I don't know. But, um, sometimes we need to remember when we have really special times with God. And so sometimes we'll have something that we hold on to. Some people carry a cross in their pocket or they carry a special Bible that they were given at a special time in their life. Or maybe they just come in here and they look at the cross up here and they remember that Jesus loves us and all that he's done for us. But just like this is not anything valuable in and of itself. I mean, I could make another one of these pictures because I have it, but it reminds me of a really, really special experience. We need to remember when God touches our lives in a special way. And so you might think about that as you move forward in your relationship with God. Sometimes you may want to keep something special that helps you remember, God really does love me, or God really did encounter my life in a very special way. Do you think you can do that? So let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you that we can trust that you really do love us. Help us to remember that always. And Lord, when we encounter you in special ways, Help us to remember. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming down. Enjoy the long weekend. As we prepare to go to God in prayer, I would ask you to especially be mindful of those who were impacted by Hurricane Ida, not only in our neighboring state of Louisiana, but all up and down the East Coast, all the way to the Northeast and, and out. And there's another hurricane out in the Gulf. So just be in prayer for all of those impacted, those who have lost not only everything that they have except for the clothes on their back but those who have lost lives uh, whose family members have died as a result of the hurricane 
Let us be in prayer for them. And at the beginning of Pastor Mark's sermon, we're going to have something we don't often have here at First Frisco. We will be taking up a second offering um, for the victims of, uh, for hurricane relief. Amen. So the first offering will be our regular offering. And then a second offering, Pastor Mark will call for when he gets ready to do his sermon for hurricane relief. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious and heavenly Father, we come now, Lord, this day, thanking you, O oh God, for receiving us and for allowing us to be before you. We come, O oh God, kneel down before you with humble hearts and bow down heads. We come before you, O oh God, bringing you all that we are and all that we have. We glory and honor in your presence, O oh God. We lift you up before men, women, boys, and girls, that all may know you and know not only about you, but will know who you are and your characteristics will come to want to have a real and solid relationship with you. We come, Lord, just thanking you for last night's lying down and this morning's rising up. Thank you, O oh God, that we had this opportunity to come together once more and again to, to praise and worship you together. Oh, Lord, we are so grateful that you've blessed us to have health and strength and life abundantly. We are bringing before you, O oh God, those who are sick in body and mind, those, O oh God, who are in hospital rooms, lying on sick beds, those who are at home, unable to rise up on their own, and those, O oh God, who sit beside their bedsides, holding their hand as they are going through treatment, as they are going through surgery or surgery recovery. Oh God, we are so thankful for the doctors and nurses, but we know that you are the great physician. So heal, touch, and deliver as only you know how, oh God. Touch them right now, oh God, from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. Feel them through and through. We thank you, oh God, for this opportunity to come before you and hear your word again. The preach word as we continue experiencing God in the many ways, oh God, that we need to grow. Help us, O oh God, to stay in your word and to stay on our knees in prayer through your word, living it out. And we pre pray now, O oh God, the prayer that is found in your word, the prayer that the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said to say these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. See 
As, as we, uh, as I start now, our ushers are going to end up coming up again, and if you are writing a check, make that out to First Frisco, United Methodist Church, and then just designate Hurricane Relief. Many of us have shifted completely to electronic forms of giving. Uh, you're welcome to do that. Send it to the church to designate your gift, um, Hurricane Relief or Hurricane Ida, and uh, we'll probably have Julie put a link up on the website also. So I uh, just wanted to we need to be ready to respond. Um, you know, if we had been hit like the East Coast and Louisiana had been hit, we'd need help too. So the family of God is bigger than our church here in Frisco, Texas. So um, I was told by Shannon, you know, a lot of times when things are going on in your lives and things are always going on in our lives, uh, we are typically having trouble with grieving a loss or maybe dealing with a medical condition or whatever. And one of the frustrating things for us sometimes uh, as a church staff is you don't tell us. And that's your right. But, but we, we want to know, uh, not because we want to intrude or disrupt, but because we want to be able to pray for you. And so I've, I've felt very strongly that way for a long time. And so as I was coming up on an event this next week, Shannon said, Mark, you need to take your own medicine. So I'm going to. So on Wednesday, I have shoulder surgery. And I've uh, been kind of working through this for quite a while. It's going to be good. Uh, we're taking care of it, but I would, I would appreciate your prayers. I just didn't want to go through that. And then later on, you go, why didn't Mark tell us what he was dealing with? So uh, I just figured I'd better take my own message. Because sometimes a lot of us want a lot of help and attention and prayers. And some of us want to just sort of crawl under the porch and be by ourselves. But we need each other as the family of God. So Wednesday, I'm, I'm having total reverse shoulder replacement. Uh, that sounds really, you know how it is. You become an expert on stuff when it happens to you. And so now I know what that means. Um, but it's a pretty quick recovery, but I won't be here next Sunday. Cheryl's going to be preaching and Steve's going to be handling the rest. And, but you can be praying for me. So I wanted to put that out there. How many of you would like to hear from God? Yeah, that's, I mean, if you just think about it, that question usually gets a pretty positive response. I've got this, uh, this particular graphic up there today. Most of you recognize that, particularly those of us who've been around a little longer than others. Is That's the RCA Victor sort of logo, and uh, here's where that came from. In, 19, in 1899, Francis Barad painted a picture of his brother's dog. The dog's name was Nipper. And Nipper was a terrier mongrel kind of a dog. All this stuff has been carefully researched. And he was, he's listening to a wind-up Edison Bell cylinder phonograph. And you ever call the dog's name and they kind of turn their head, you know, like that? I say, Bonnie. She hears me, she turns her head, she's paying attention. But in 1929... His master's voice, this particular picture, uh, that was trademarked and acquired by Radio Corporation of America, RCA. And so Nipper became kind of the RCA mascot. And the implication is that the sound quality is so good that if his master's voice is played across this device, the dog recognizes his master's voice. We need to learn to recognize our master's voice as Christians. Um, John Stott, who's one of my favorite theologians, an Anglican priest um, who's now deceased, I had a chance to hear him speak personally in Fort Worth one time at an Episcopal church, a uh, lifelong leader of the Anglican church, writer, preacher. He was also a lifelong bird watcher, and he, he kind of caught that passion from his dad as a boy. And in his lifetime, I think he personally encountered 20,000 different species of birds. And when he went out with his dad as a small boy, his dad said, shut your mouth and open your eyes and ears. 
shut your mouth and open your eyes and ears. Now, you all, you remember as children, I remember when I was a children, you know, you get released for, for recess or whatever, and you go screaming outside onto the playground. Well, those who learn to kind of experience things in nature, bird watching, animal watching, whatever, you learn that if you're really quiet and still, you see a whole lot more. And so that was kind of the lesson that his dad taught him. John chapter 8, 47, Jesus says, Whoever is from God hears the words of God. And he's talking to some others. He says, the reason you do not hear them is that you're not from God. That would be kind of a painful thing for Jesus to say to us, wouldn't it? We're kind of covering a lot of volume with each of these sermons with the Experiencing God series. So I'm kind of covering six chapters. We're just going to kind of hit the high points and the highlights. But chapter 10 says God speaks. God speaks, and in fact, Scripture from beginning to end is about God speaking, speaking things into existence, the Word made flesh, and on and on and on. But how do I know when God speaks? How do I recognize my Master's voice, as it were? And Blackaby is very intentional about saying, here's the way that we do that. And the first thing he says is, we establish a loving relationship. Um, My wife speaks to me a lot. Every day. And and most of the time, she's not angry at me. I speak to my wife a lot. And most of the time, we hear each other. Right? Because we've got a relationship. And because we have a relationship, we're listening, we understand, we're ready, we we recognize. Um, And that's what Blackaby says is really the first step with hearing from God, is understanding that God wants a love relationship with each and every one of us. And when I'm in a relationship, I'm a lot more attuned to a person's voice. I'm a lot more likely to recognize their voice. I'm a lot uh, more likely to be able to distinguish their voice from some other voice. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And he's talking about a relationship with a shepherd and sheep. So, How do we know, how how do we know when God speaks? First, we need to establish a love relationship. The next point that he makes is one that really sounds counterintuitive because sometimes we think, well, how do I distinguish God's voice from all the other voices that are out there? You know, there's a lot to listen to in this world, isn't there? Um, You have probably heard this example before, but it comes from experiencing God. Um, In it, Blackaby gives the example of a friend of his who was part of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police anti-counterfeiting work. Anti-counterfeiting work, like getting bad or uh, counterfeit money out of circulation. And so he talked about how they got to where they recognized counterfeit money. And you can imagine all the different ways there are to counterfeit, but they didn't study all the counterfeits. They only studied the real thing. They became so familiar with the real currency that anything else sort of caught them is sort of a startling contrast. And so that's what we need to do is really focus on God. A lot of times we say, well, don't we have a spiritual enemy? Yes. Isn't that spiritual enemy powerful? Yes. But greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And so I focus on my master. I focus on on the one that I'm following and all the other stuff will be taken care of. Greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. So establish a love relationship and focus on God, not the counterfeit. Next, let the word be our guide, and we're going to talk more about this later. And then finally, as we enter into this love relationship, more and more that spirit within us is communing with God's spirit, and we can really be directed uh, in a much less forceful way. We're much more ready to follow the impulses and leadings of the Spirit instead of having to be drug around by the nose or whatever, um, as Jesus talks about sometimes animals that just have to have their will broken. Here's some of the mistakes that we can make when we decide that we want to have an experience with God, which is what we've really been talking about. First, we can say, well, God, show me a miraculous 
signs. Show me something that just kind of removes beyond all doubt that I'm hearing from anything else. The only thing for us to remember is that's what the Pharisees asked for. The Pharisees were following Jesus around. They were listening to his preaching, his teaching, watching his healing, and yet they were really looking for an opportunity to trip him up. And they would say, hey, you know, we could probably believe in you, but you need to show us a sign. And he told them, you know, you're an evil and faithless generation. And in fact, they saw him raise his friend Lazarus from the dead, and it was on that day that they decided, okay, we got to kill this guy. So how much good did that do? We don't need to do that. What we need to do is really enter into that love relationship. And the truth is, is when the sign comes along, it'll catch us by surprise anyway. Um, looking for a specific method. Well, God called Moses with a burning bush, and so I'm just going to kind of watch my backyard and see if anything catches fire, because that's probably how God's going to speak to me. Well, the truth is, God spoke to Moses through a burning bush once. God spoke to Balaam through his donkey once. But it caught them by surprise, and it wasn't their daily direction. Um, don't, don't look to say, well, God's going to speak to me, and he's only going to speak to me in this way. Another thing is, is uh, name it, claim it. Sometimes people get caught up in name it, claim it with financial issues. Sometimes pastors can get caught up in name it, claim it when it comes to prompting their church on financial issues. But that, they'll take a verse in the Bible like if you ask anything in my name and believe it, you know, it's going to be given to you. Well, over and over again, Blackaby rightly says, look, what we're supposed to do is see where God is at work and then come alongside. It's not about saying, God, here's what I want, give me. It's not like the Janis Joplin line, you know, oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Or Lord, won't you buy me a night on the town? Um, it's not about what we want and then God comes. It's about us wanting what God wants, sensing where he's working and coming alongside. Another thing that he uh, kind of um, rebuffs is, is this idea of closed doors. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, if God closes a door, he opens a window? Blackaby says this whole responding to closed doors is probably not scriptural. You remember the parable that we've preached on, the persistent widow, when she came to the place, the one who had the authority to grant her what she wanted and she didn't get it, she persisted, she kept on. So if God leads us, and we're really listening to God, it's not to say that we're never going to say, I mean, need to alter course a little bit, but if God leads us to a closed door, we don't necessarily need to alter course. We might need to pray. We might need to wait for God to open it. We might need to listen. We might need to wait. But we don't need to immediately alter course. Stay faithful in what you know and listen and persist. And then the last thing is, is you know, if God ever calls me to lead a whole nation out of slavery in Egypt, you know, I think I'm going to be ready. If God ever asks me to do something big, I'm going to be ready. But you know, God's never really asked me to do something big. Well, what's always going to happen is God's always going to form our character before he gives us the assignment. So a lot of those times when we feel like we're wasting time or waiting around or what we're doing isn't very important, what it's really doing is forming our character. Before Moses ever went to lead the people out of the promised land, which he was overwhelmed by that task and really tried to get out of it, he had already learned and grown in Pharaoh's household. He knew kind of the inner workings of uh, leadership in Egypt. He had already spent 40 years following his, his uh, father-in-law's sheep around in the back of a desert. And he had been formed and humbled and thoughtful and prayerful. And I'm sure he was thinking, you know, what my life might have been. And once his character was formed, then God called him into his service with something big. But he had learned to follow God in the small things. He would learned to be faithful. Luke chapter 16, 10, this is one of my favorite verses, not because I always follow it perfectly, but because it, it really reminds me of something I need to hear. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. How many of you know people at work or people in your family, 
If they say they got it, they got it. And how many of you know there are people in your family or at work, if they say they got it, they don't got it. They don't got it. The truth is, is the way we learn to be with small, seemingly insignificant things is really forming our character. And we're going to do, if, if we are a person of the truth, if we're a person of our word, if we're a person of integrity, if we have a strong work ethic, if we're for others, if we're loving, if we're faithful in small things, guess how we're going to be in the big things? And on the flip side, if we're not faithful in those small things, guess how we're going to be in the big things? We can't get ready for the big thing if we're not being faithful in the small things. God develops our character before he calls us to the assignment. How do we allow God to deal with our character? Serve faithfully where God has called you. I mean, don't, don't serve faithfully where God hasn't called you. If God calls you someplace, get there and serve faithfully where God calls you and then serve faithfully in the small things. We believe in a revealed theology. Revealed theology means that we don't know God because we're so smart and we've spent so much time figuring out who God is. We believe that we know God because God has stooped to make himself known. God made us. He wants us to know him. And what happens when we get to know God? Well, God reveals his character. God is the same yesterday and today and forever. And as we get to know God's character, we can say, well, of course, that's who God is. That's what God wants. And of course, that has nothing to do with the way God works. God's going to reveal his character. God's going to reveal his purposes. Here's what I want done. God's purposes are going to be contrasted with our plans, and we got a choice to make. Am I going to hold on to my plans, or am I going to come alongside of God's plans? And then God reveals his ways. God's ways are redemptive. That, means, that doesn't mean that nothing bad is going to ever happen to us, but God can be, bring good. God can redeem any bad situation. God's ways are loving. God's ways are compassionate. God's ways are cleansing and forgiving. God's ways build people up. God's ways bring humility. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I always need to remember that. Pride goes before a fall. His way is the way of service and love. We will not carry out God's plan with our own methods. God speaks through the Bible. That may seem kind of like a duh, but God speaks through the Bible. In the Old Testament, you, you see God speaking to people through angels and visions and dreams, symbolic actions, a gentle whisper, miraculous signs, prophets, burning bushes, talking donkeys. You see that happening in Scripture. Then in the Gospels, we have the Word made flesh. We have God incarnate. We have Jesus. God speaks through Jesus in Acts and beyond we have the birth of the church. We have the Holy Spirit transforming and bringing the harvest. The Bible teaches us to recognize God's voice. I have a, a cell phone. You probably all have a cell phone, maybe two or three. You all have a cell phone. I probably have, I think I looked yesterday, I have 798 contacts on my cell phone. Just over time, I use my phone both for business and for personal stuff. But I've got two people, two callers that call me probably five times a week that I really don't want to hear from. Can we, I'm just trying to be honest. The truth will set you free. You know who they are? One of them is spam and the other one's telemarketer. I block probably five numbers a day. Do I answer those calls? No. And beyond spam and telemarketer, I've got several others that don't show up as spam or telemarketing. That I, I block. Why do I block those calls? I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to hear what they have to say. I don't want to buy what they're selling. I don't even know what they're selling, but I don't want to find out. You know where that leads. What is it, have you ever had somebody who quit returning your calls or texts or emails or 
maybe running your letters through a shredder? You ever had a relationship that kind of all of a sudden went from here to here? What do we call that with a phone? When someone does that to us, ghosting, ghosting, dumped, <laughs> whatever, ghosting. When, when someone ghosts us, Cheryl would like, she's over here laughing. Who got ghost? <laughs> somebody got ghosted over here. Or maybe they're ghosting somebody. When we ghost somebody, we're like, we're done. You know, maybe there's some repair that needs to happen. Maybe there's an apology that needs to be made. Maybe there's something that just kind of is on hold. But most of the time it means one person or the other is going, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I don't want a love relationship with you of any kind. So here's the thing. If we don't read the Bible, we likely don't want to hear from God. We don't really want to talk to God. So that may seem, I'm not really trying to lay a guilt trip on you, but if I really want to know God, if I want to hear from God, and I don't read this, I'm probably not, I probably really don't want to hear from God. Is there anything in here that's confusing and hard to understand? Yes. Yes. But fight through it. I mean, I would say start with the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the Gospels. Read them twice. Move on to the letters of Paul and to Acts. Psalms is beautiful. You know, you can, you can resonate with Psalms. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, wisdom literature. But let the Gospels be your lenses through which you look back and understand the Old Testament. But if we don't read the Bible, we probably don't really want to hear from God. And I, I think, you know, most everybody says, I do want to hear. I just don't know if I want to hear from God that bad. How do we encounter God through the Bible? So, I mean, it's one thing to just say we ought to read this, but how do we encounter God through the Bible? First of all, read it. I, for me, I have a time that's just my time in the morning. If I try to read in the evening, it's a lost cause. I start bouncing my head off the Bible or the book, whatever it is I'm reading. My time is in the morning, so I, I have a couple of devotionals that I read every morning, and then I spend some time in Scripture. Um. This is different than reading War and Peace. Right? God really speaks to us through this. And it says it's sort of like the scales fall away from our eyes. The scales fall away from our heart. We can really begin over time as we understand who God is to hear His voice. And it speaks to us in a different way. And then we're called to adjust. And, and Blackaby brings up that word adjust over and over again. And it's really challenging. We're going to talk later about maybe how we could make some specific adjustments. Because the adjustments you need to make and the adjustments I need to make might be very different. And one adjustment for me might be easy, but excruciating for you and vice versa. Then he says we need to obey. He separates adjustment from obedience. He says by adjusting, we're really putting ourselves in a position to obey. And then once we put ourselves into a position to obey, then he comes to us and he says, okay, here's, here's what I have in mind, and now you're in a position to obey, but you still have to follow through. And then God accomplishes his purposes through us. And then listen, on the backside of that whole process, it says the relationship deepens. Now think about the closest relationships you have or have ever had. So much of the depth of those relationships has to do with the road that you've traveled together, the things you've accomplished together, the crises you've been through together, maybe the fights you've had with one another, and then made up and realized that you loved each other anyway. Read, listen for the Spirit, adjust, obey, let God accomplish His purposes, and then the relationship deepens. So what would that kind of look like in practical terms? Pick out a particular passage of Scripture. Write down, a lot of times it helps to have sort of a, a, a prayer journal. Meditate, that just simply means pray. Pray on what you've read. Um, identify the adjustments. This isn't before you make the adjustments. Identify, okay, if I were going to adjust to this, what would those adjustments look like? Write down a prayer. Lord, help me. A lot of times just writing scripture can be as a, as a prayer, especially like in Psalms. Then you make the adjustments, don't try to make 10 in a day. You may not want to make more than one a week. 
because that gives you time to kind of work on it and to keep working on it and go back to working on it. Pay attention to how God is using new truth and then take action and obey. One of the things that uh, was shared with me that I, I kind of has adopted as a standard, not that I always follow it perfectly, is that my answer to anything God tells me to do should be yes, even before I know what it is. Be done with negotiating. You know, be done with compromising. If God tells me to do something, my answer should be yes, even before I know what it is that God is telling me to do. We need to kind of bring that attitude into our relationship with God. If we don't read the Bible, we likely really don't want to hear from God. How might we make adjustments in Scripture? Let's get down to some practicalities, because I know many of you have before, but if I'm just kind of talking about this as theory, sometimes it doesn't, it, it's hard for, it, for us to understand. Blackaby gives a specific example of a friend of his who borrowed money from his parents after college. Now, you know, it's easy to find people just coming out of college who need money, and it's probably a lot of parents who give their kids money coming out of college, but you know, and sometimes parents say this is a gift. Sometimes they say, you know, you say, hey, loan me X number of dollars and I'll pay you back later. With parents, sometimes maybe the bill never comes due. <laughs> but this guy borrowed $5,000 from his parents and then kind of went on with life and forgot about it. Parents never asked him for it. But he read this scripture, Psalm 37, 21. <laughs> Get this. The wicked borrows and does not repay. And he goes, I guess that even applies to my parents. And so he paid his parents back the $5,000. I have a couple of examples of my own. Matthew 5, 37 says, Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. You might say, well, what does that mean? Well, James doubles down on it. James chapter 5, 12. Above all, my beloved, do not swear either by heaven or or earth, or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. So here's the adjustment. As I'm reading this, I'm thinking, here's the adjustment. No reason ever to say, I swear, or I promise. I swear on a stack of Bibles. I swear on your mother's grave. You all have relationships with people. How much difference does that make? I have relationships with people. If they say they're going to do it, it's done. They don't need to raise their voice. They don't need to promise or whatever. I have other people that could swear on a stack of Bibles and everybody's mother's grades, and you know you got real problems because they don't follow through. So if I'm the kind of person that says I need to let my yes be yes and my no be no, sometimes I need to say no, but if I say yes, that's enough, and people will learn whether or not my word can be trusted. Here's another example, James 1, 19 through 20. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Now, how many, how many of you have all of those down? Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So I read that verse, I've read it many times, and I go, you know, I need to make some adjustments. I'm not always quick to speak. But I can be really slow to listen sometimes. And I can be way too quick to be angry sometimes. So I needed to make an adjustment in light of what God was saying to me through Scripture. I needed to become a better listener. I needed to understand the value of just listening. I needed to be slower to offer my two cents. Sometimes I needed to just be silent. There's a lot more value in that. Than, in fact, the longer I've gone, the more I've met wise people, the more I realize they don't have to say near as much as I do sometimes. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And then I need to become angry less often. And I certainly need to stop acting and reacting with anger as the fuel. Anger is terrible fuel for life. It burns way too hot, and it ends up burning us and everybody else around. So it's not that I'm never going to be angry, but I need to process that anger. I need to give that anger to God. I need to pray about it. I need to pray for the other person. I need to forgive my enemy before I do anything. 
before I say anything, I needed to make an adjustment. God speaks through prayer. Prayer is about that love relationship and just learning to keep a conversation going. Do we have formal prayers that sort of mark points in our day? Yes, meals, bedtime, uh, all those sorts of things. But we just really need to kind of get into a conversation. You don't need any special language. God knows what it says. The scripture says God knows what is on our heart before we ever say it. Prayer is about a relationship. Prayer is about learning to listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. If I'm really learning about God's character, God's purposes, God's methods, then more and more the Spirit can prompt me rather than having to jerk me by the bit to lead me where I'm supposed to be going. I can listen to those promptings of the Spirit. Prayer is also about setting aside self so that we can have life abundant, not so that because we're not important. Here's what Jesus said to his disciples in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said this in some form in all of the Gospels. Jesus said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their crosses daily and follow me. So if we want to hear from God, we need to pray. We need to take advantage of that way. Um, so here's, here's what happens sometimes when we pray. Because usually, remember, I've got my objective, and that may be different from God's objective. So sometimes when I pray, we, we get these unexpected outcomes. One is that I, I pray for this, but I get that. I pray for this, but I get that. So what do we do? Different, bigger, sooner, later. I need to pay attention to God's answer. I need to take the answer that God gives me. And listen, I need to remember to pray. What about when we pray and we just feel like God is silent? Which God will be sometimes. Sometimes God works on us through silence. Well, we respond to silence sort of like we respond to a closed door. It's, it's, it's like, well, if God's not saying anything, I just need to throw everything out the window and change course. Or, no, keep doing Keep doing what you know God has called you to do. Hold course. And God will begin speaking again in clear ways. But sometimes God's going to let us sit with silence. What about God's timing? Um, you know, God says, here's what I want you to do, and I want you to do it right now. And you, you know, the first reaction for most of us is, well, I'm not ready for that. If we remember God's character, that God is love, God's timing is always right. And we learn to just move forward in trust, even though we don't see the way everything's going to work out. Prayer is about a love relationship. If we don't pray, it's likely that we really don't want to hear from God. God speaks through circumstances, but this gets a little dicey. Um, circumstances, God speaking through circumstances is way different than being driven by how we feel about our circumstances in the moment. Experience alone is really unreliable. But we can learn to sort of look for God in our circumstances, and we can learn to trust God despite our circumstances. Most of all, we hear God in circumstances after the fact. You remember when Pastor Steve was talking about how he's really good at seeing how God was working in the rearview mirror. After the fact, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Most of the time, our circumstances make sense later. In the moment, they can be overwhelming or terrifying or frustrating. And so we got to be really careful, but we, we hold on and trust. But then later, those circumstances can really make sense. We don't have God's perspective. God knows how it's going to come out. God knows where he's taking us. God knows what's next. But often our, our circumstances are overwhelming or confusing. So here's an example of where circumstances were really, really extreme, but the person had to hold on by faith. And if all they were saying was, you know, look, my, my circumstances are a direct reflection of how God feels about me. God must not love me. Think about the biblical character of Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph was his, his father's favorite. His brothers hated his guts. So they decided to betray him. They sold him into slavery. 
Even as a slave, he was falsely accused of a crime he didn't commit. He was thrown into prison. He was a good guy. The prison guard trusted him. He kind of supervised the whole operation. He was forgotten, though. Eventually, he was summoned because he could interpret dreams. He interprets Pharaoh's dream. And then after all these years, he becomes the number two authority in the kingdom of Egypt. But think about all of his circumstances before that time. Here's what we have to do when it comes to our circumstances. No matter where we are now, no matter what we get into tomorrow or the next day, we have to settle the issue that God loves you. I have to settle the issue that God loves me. If you look at that cross, if it doesn't make any other sense to you, it says beyond a shadow of a doubt, God loves you. God wouldn't let any obstacle, your sin, his pain, anything stand between him and you and that love relationship. So when we're in the middle of our circumstances, we have to hold on inside to the fact that we know God's character. God loves me despite what's going on in my life right now, then trust God's love in the circumstances. God can bring good out of even the most devastating circumstances. That's what redemption means. It's not that the circumstances were good, and we just didn't understand they were good. Okay, those circumstances were bad, but God can redeem those circumstances however they occurred. The other thing that happens in Scripture, particularly as Jesus and his disciples are walking around, is, is they had to learn that whatever they felt, whatever was going on in their circumstances, truth was standing right in front of them. Jesus said, I am the truth and the way and the life. I am the truth. So when they're confronted with these incredible circumstances, like Jesus saying, you know, why don't you feed these 5,000 people? Or these 5,000 men plus women and children. They go, I can't do that. And he goes, watch. Remember who I am. I am the truth. And everybody was fed and there were leftovers. Those same disciples get into the boat. These are disciples who've been on the lake their whole life because they were fishermen. And a storm comes up. Jesus, save us. Don't you care? He wakes up, calms the storm. Don't you remember who I am? I am the truth. The widow at Nain, her son, has died. Jesus raises him from the dead. And all of a sudden, you know, the truth is standing right in front of her. It's really easy sometimes for us to sort of overlook in our circumstances, be overwhelmed by our circumstances. We just need to hold on. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me loves me. Jesus is bigger than my circumstances. Blackaby uses the parable of the train tracks where he describes the church as a body. And here's why God speaks through the church. Now, you know, it's our job to have a spirit of unity in the church. It's our job to be operating individually, to offer up our individual gifts. It's our job as church members to make room for other people's spiritual gifts and then to let all that work in a spirit of unity. There's a lot of churches I've been to where I couldn't find Jesus. That's what happens sometimes in churches. You see the very best and you can see the very, very worst. But God speaks through the church. And specifically, Blackaby's using the example of the body of Christ, which we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and also in Ephesians. And he says, okay, suppose... The body of Christ is walking down a train track. And the ear says, there's a train coming. Well, if I'm not gifted like the ear, my temptation is to say, as an eye, you know, I can't see it. Let's keep going. But as we enter into a relationship within the church, as we end up operating in our gifts, as we end up beginning to learn who the others are that are operating their gifts, somebody might be able to speak into my life because they see something that I don't. God speaks through the church when the church is being the church, when the church is being the body of Christ. And so our challenge is to to really offer up our gifts 
1 Corinthians 12 says the purpose of that is for the building up of the whole. Not for the exalting of self, but for the building up of the whole. I need to make my gifts available to bless others. You need to make your gifts available to bless others. And all of a sudden, God can speak through that. God speaks through the church. Blackaby talks about physical markers of spiritual encounters. There were several times as the Israelites were moving from Egypt to the promised land that he would say, okay, build an altar of stones, you know, one stone for every tribe, that sort of thing. Build an altar, he'll build an altar there. But it's a physical marker of a very specific encounter with God. I talked about this earlier in the children's moment. Um, You have physical markers of specific encounters or experiences in life. We need to do that with God. Because we have short memories sometimes. And when God works in our life in a miraculous way, we need to hold on to something, not because it's magical, but because it helps us remember God really does love me. God really did show up. God really did perform a miracle in our life or in our church. This is a physical marker for me. Homer has one of these. This is the ribbon from the ribbon cutting for our ministries building over here. Um, For those of you who don't remember or weren't involved with all the decisions, we were doing the Nehemiah project and we say, okay, we have to, you know, one day get our sanctuary renovated. We're going to one day build a children's building and a connecting corridor. And of course, we're going to need to redo what we've got for the uh, uh, our existing children's building into an adult ministry center. Well, as we started putting all that together and sequencing it, our revenue and our expenses didn't add up, and we wanted to keep the promise that we made not to take on additional debt as we were doing this. So we just kind of cut the ministries building out of the plan. That was the last in the sequence. That was the logical place to cut. God had another plan. We already had the plan. We'd already identified the need, but we didn't have the resources, and that put us in a position for God to show up and do something that we didn't plan for. So we have a flood in the building. About two hours after the flood, we realize Christmas is coming. (laughs) We're going to have a chance to do something that we weren't going to have to do at all. And now we've got this physical reminder of God's incredible act. So, I mean, on the one hand, I've got this ribbon from the ribbon cutting. On the other hand, all of us, I can't look at that building without thinking about God's miraculous provision. Honestly, I just can't do it. I look at that building and I'm going, wow, that's pure God. That's pure God in us moving in unity as a, as a community in response to God's provision. We need to hold on to those kinds of physical markers of times when we have encountered God in real spirit and in truth. God wants to speak to us. Do we want to listen? Are we going to read our Bible? Are we going to pray? Are we going to really make the adjustments in life and enter into that love relationship? Let's pray together. Oh, Holy Lord, thank you so much that we can trust your love. Oh, Holy Lord, thank you that you've called us to be the body of Christ. Lord, thank you that we can know you, that you don't play hide and seek. Lord, help us to really be committed to hearing our master's voice. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Closing hymn today, number 395, Take Time to Be Holy. Listen to the words.
receive this benediction before we depart. Let us go forth now as people of God who hear God's voice, heed God's direction, and are obedient to God's word. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.